General questions. We now turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know the problems that our NHS is facing an ageing population, increasing demand, and a Scottish Government which has quite simply failed to keep up with the need to recruit and retain the staff that are required. Earlier this week, we discovered that £157 million of the NHS budget is being spent on bringing in agency nurses because of staff shortages. So we know that there's a problem with nurse recruitment. But can the First Minister tell me how many vacant NHS consultant positions have been lying unfilled for more than six months? First Minister. Well, in terms of NHS vacancies, the position now in terms of NHS vacancies uh, is, in some cases, better than it was when we took office, in other cases, uh, almost uh, the same. But I think what people across Scotland will be particularly interested in is the fact that today we have record high staffing in the NHS. Today, compared to when the SNP took office, uh, there are almost 11,400 whole-time equivalent additional staff working in our NHS. Uh, qualified nurses and midwives are up by nearly 6%. Doctors are up by uh, over 26%. And medical and dental uh, consultants are now at a record high, up by 42.9%. That's the reality of the workforce in our NHS. And all of these uh, doctors and nurses and supporting staff in our NHS, of course, are working hard to make sure that patients are seen quickly and they get world-class treatment when they do so. And all of us owe them an enormous debt of gratitude for that. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister pretty keen to give out every single number apart from the one that I asked for. So let me give her that answer. The answer is there are 162 unfilled consultant posts. That's up 14% in just three months and up by more than 300% since 2011. And the fact is this, Dr Nikki Thompson of the BMA's Scottish Consultants Committee says, and I'll quote it here, the Scottish Government must recognise that they have major recruitment and retention problem and take action. Does the First Minister recognise that in the way that Dr Nikki Thompson wants her to and will she prioritise that action without delay? Well, we are prioritising action to make sure we recruit and retain staff in our NHS. Now, uh, Ruth Davidson speaks specifically about the consultant vacancy rate. The consultant vac vacancy rate uh, in our NHS today is lower than it was when this government took office. It was 7% uh, when we took office. It's now at 6.5%. And of course, that is a percentage of a total number of consultants working in our NHS that is much higher than it was when we took office. So however you cut it, however you look at the statistics, there are more people, including more doctors and nurses, working in our NHS today than was the case when the SNP took office. Now, I think that is a record to be proud of, uh, but I know that we must continue to improve our NHS so that it continues to provide good quality care for people across Scotland. That's why we set out at the election, the, uh, in a manifesto that of course we were elected on, plans not only to invest record sums, more than any other party proposed in our NHS, but to make sure we're reforming our NHS in the years to come to ensure that it continues to do the fantastic work that it already does. Well, let's look at the facts on the ground. I have here the latest NHS Lothian report into the ongoing problems at St John's paediatric unit in Livingston. And let me quote what it says. There is a continuing heavy reliance on a small number of staff doing additional night and weekend shifts and prone to short notice collapse because of sickness or other unplanned absence. It adds that only four of the nine out of our slots are filled on a substantive basis. And it continues. The middle grade medical rota remains unstable due to vacancies. And on some occasions, advanced nurse practitioners or paediatric nurse practitioners are required to fill rota gaps. In other words, backfilling for doctors because they can't get the staff. Now, this may be an exceptional case, but it is utterly unacceptable. The doctors say we need action. And isn't this right here the consequence of inaction from this government? Yeah. First Minister. Well, in terms of uh, 
paediatrics at St John's. Uh, yes, there are challenges there. I, I don't think that comes as news to anybody, but it is exactly uh, those challenges that prompted NHS Lothian to commission an expert report on the future of the paediatric unit. And uh, that report is currently being considered uh, by NHS uh, Lothian. And I, I know that they will, uh, supported by the Scottish Government, take forward whatever actions require to be taken forward. I, I should, of course, uh, point out uh, the fact uh, that under the SNP, the situation at St John's Hospital in general terms is a lot more positive uh, and that hospital is in a much stronger position than it was when this government took office because we provided funding for a new MRI scanner, we provided funding for a new short stay elective surgery unit, we redesigned A&E, we refurbished the labour ward and the special uh, care baby unit, uh, there has been a new lab a medicine training school opened, uh, a new regional eating disorders unit opened, uh, these are a, a range of improvements made at that hospital and we're determined to make sure uh, that we do the same in paediatrics as well. So I will never stand here, for goodness sake, I'm a, I'm a former health secretary, I will never stand in this chamber and say there are no challenges to be overcome in our National Health Service. Scotland is not unique in that sense, but we have more staff in our NHS. We are investing record sums of money in our NHS. That is why there are waiting times that in many cases are not just lower in Scotland now than when we took office, they are considerably lower than they are in other parts of the UK. And when you look at the situation in uh, England, where the Tories, of course, are in government, uh, and compare, I, I know they don't like this, but compare, compare the fact that junior doctors have been in strike in England and not in Scotland. And look at A&E just as one example. Performance in our core A&E units is 10 percentage points better in Scotland than it is under the Tories in England. So we'll keep working to improve our National Health Service, but we'll take no lectures from the Tories on how to do it. Ruth Davidson. I know the First Minister is off to London tonight for a debate, but we're talking about the Scottish NHS that her government has been in charge of for nine years. And I think that the First Minister is right to point out that the Royal College is about to publish a report into St John's. But what she didn't mention is that the SNP government tried to push it back until after the election because they were worried about what it might say. And she didn't mention that this was against the wishes of health bosses in the area who feared that a delay in publication would only add to uncertainty over the ward's future. We need a, a serious and honest debate about how best we create a sustainable NHS in Scotland. What we don't need is an SNP spin operation which tries to bury bad news because it's politically inconvenient. So we've got gaps in nursing, we've got gaps in consultants and we've got gaps in GPs. After nine years, isn't it time that the SNP government sorted it out? First Minister. Well, I know, I know the Conservatives have replaced uh, Labour in this chamber as the official opposition, but I didn't uh, really appreciate that that meant Ruth Davidson was going to stand up here and use recycled scare stories from Neil Finlay uh, about St John's Hospital. I, I thought she might be aspiring to better than that, but clearly not. The fact of the matter is, Decisions around the expert report, the timing of that and uh, taking forward the recommendations of that will be matters for NHS Lothian and the Scottish Government will support them in doing that. And can I say uh, to Ruth Davidson, yes, we're talking about the Scottish NHS and I'm talking about the improvements we've seen in the Scottish NHS under this government. All I was doing was comparing that to some of the respects in which the NHS, where the Tories are in charge of it, has gone backwards instead of forwards, where we've had the sight of junior doctors out on strike because of the intransigence of a Tory government. So we'll keep taking action to improve our health service. And yes, this government has now been in office for nine years. And let me just uh, remind people in this chamber what we've seen over these nine years. Record high staffing. Staffing up by more than 11,000. Nurse numbers up, doctors numbers up, consultant numbers up, paramedic numbers up, GP numbers up. Senior managers, incidentally, the numbers of them are down because we've more than met our target to reduce them. So the NHS is in good hands and we'll make sure it keeps moving in the right direction. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet Carers Scotland. First Minister. Well, I hope uh, that I'll have the opportunity to meet Carers Scotland soon. Uh, the Minister for Public Health will meet Carers Scotland uh, next week. And of course, 
As everyone in the chamber uh, will be aware, this week is Carers Week, and therefore I want to take this opportunity, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, to thank carers and young carers for everything that they do on our behalf. President Officer, earlier this week, the First Minister was named as the 50th most powerful woman in the world. Today, a report by UCAS confirmed that the number of students from poorer backgrounds going to university has dropped. When will the First Minister use some of her immense power to improve the life chances of Scotland's young people? First Minister. Ke Ke Kezia Dugdale clearly pays more attention to these things than, than I do, but on the... On the <laughs> Never mind if... If she keeps trying, I'm sure she'll, she'll get there eventually. But on the, on the important matter, on the important and very serious matter that Kezia Dugdale rightly raises this morning, um, I, as people would expect me to have, have studied these figures in some detail. They show that we are absolutely right to prioritise fair access to university. But I think it's also important and appropriate to look at the figures in the round. Firstly, they come with the usual health warning. They don't include the substantial number of students in Scotland who enter higher education through college. But let's look specifically at what they do show. Uh, looking at 18-year-olds exclusively, the numbers from our most deprived areas dropped slightly from 2014 to 2015, but nevertheless are up considerably compared to 2010. But the more fundamental point, presiding officer, is this one. Not everybody who goes to university uh, goes at 18. So when you look at these figures and look at the figures for people of all ages, the numbers from the most deprived areas, both applying to and being accepted to university, is up in 2015 compared to 2014, in both cases by about 10%. So yes, we have got work to do. I have been very clear about that. That's why implementing the Widening Access Commission report is so important. But it's simply wrong to say that progress hasn't been made. Kezia Dugdale. What I heard there, President Officer, was three different excuses, I think, about why the numbers are wrong, rather than an explanation as to why her government yeah. haven't done yeah. enough. Yeah. And what these figures show, what these figures very clearly show, First Minister, is that there has been a drop in the number of people from poorer backgrounds applying to university. And there has been an even bigger drop in the number of poorer people being accepted when they do apply. This is what happens when you cut grants and bursaries by a third. And this is a government that recently tried to scrap a scheme that secured university places for the poorest students. And students are worried that the First Minister will try that again. She says she wants 20% of university students to come from the poorest backgrounds by 2030. Given that ambition, can she guarantee today that her government will fully fund this scheme for the lifetime of this parliament? First Minister. I have made very clear that we are determined to increase access and to do what is required to take to do that. But can I say to Kezia Dugdale, and I, I hope we can uh, find some agreement here, I did not say the figures that she cited were wrong. On the contrary, I said they were right. I simply pointed out what the figures actually say. What Kezia Dugdale says they uh, say is right for 18-year-olds entering university in this year. But 18-year-olds from our most deprived uh, communities entering university has gone up from 2010 to 2015. And in terms of people of all ages going to university, whether it's applying to university or entering university, the numbers from our most deprived areas have gone up in 2015, both of them by 10%. So I'm not saying the figures are wrong. I'm simply setting out factually for this chamber what the figures actually say. I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Uh, but I've made clear that while we are making progress, I don't think that progress is going far enough or going fast enough. That's why I commissioned the widening access report. That's why I've committed to implementing all of its recommendations. We'll shortly appoint a widening access commissioner. And if that commissioner tells us that universities are not doing enough, we'll use the statutory powers we legislated for, that Labour voted against, to make sure that universities do more. We are determined to do this. We're committed to doing this. And I would hope Labour would get behind us. Earlier this week, President Officer, when the First Minister missed her health targets, she moved the goalposts. Today, she's trying to move the goalposts again when it comes to the UCAS figures. 
It is simply a fact. It is simply a fact that if you look at the UCAS figures for 2015 to 2016, the situation is getting worse, First Minister, not better. So let's look at that overall picture. Poorer people are less likely to apply to university under this government. When they do apply, they are less likely to be accepted. And when they get there, they are more likely to drop out because of the cuts that you've made to bursaries and to grants. Labour's manifesto pledged to reverse the SNP government's cuts to bursaries. In light of today's news, surely the First Minister will pledge to do just that. First Minister. Well, when we last made changes to uh, the bursary uh, threshold, of course, it was the NUS president who I accept would like us to, to do more and, of course, was a member of the Widening Access Commission. It was her that described it as great news uh, for Scottish students. But, uh, and obviously, one of the other things in our manifesto was a commitment to a review of student support, which we'll take forward in the, the course of this parliament. But can I say again to Kezia Dugdy, and I will send her uh, for her information, because I know she's genuinely interested in this, the statistics that I've just been reading out. She She's wrong to say what she said. And I'm, I haven't changed a single goalpost. I'm simply, I think, in fairness, saying what the figures actually show. She's right that in terms of 18-year-olds, for one year, there has been a slight decline. But since 2010, it's up. But the more fundamental point I'm making, and this is the point she doesn't seem to grasp, is that looking at people from all ages, whether it's applications or entry to universities, the numbers from our most deprived communities are up 10%. Up 10% for applications and up 10% for entries. That's simply a fact, and it's a fact that is in these figures. So instead of arguing over the facts when you can't argue over these facts because they are what they are. Let's get behind the action that this government has decided to take uh, and I look forward to Labour uh, having the gumption to get behind us and make sure that we can achieve what we've set out to achieve. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Mr Harvey. Recent days have seen further revelations from businesses such as Sports Direct and BHS about the extent of deeply unethical business practices in this country, from exploitative zero-hours contracts to payments below the minimum wage, brutal disciplinary procedures and the intimidation, bullying and harassment of workers. Major names on the high street stand accused not only of paying poverty wages, but playing fast and loose with people's health, and throwing their employees on the economic scrap heap at a whim, even while the owners line their own pockets. The First Minister and I agree that Scotland should be able to make more decisions about workplace and employment matters, just as the STUC advocated. But does she agree that we need to use, to the greatest extent possible, the existing devolved powers and push at the edge of those powers to ensure that unethical and exploitative business practices are driven out of the Scottish economy? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I think what we heard this week in evidence down in Westminster from Mike Ashley about practices at Sports Direct uh, was absolutely and utterly appalling, shameful and unacceptable and every right-thinking person in this country should condemn that unequivocally. Uh, we as a government have, uh, as Patrick Harvey knows, established the Business Pledge which is intended to promote uh, good business practices. We also are absolutely clear about the zero tolerance we think there should be uh, to unethical business practices, whether that's of the kind we heard this week uh, or exploited of zero hours contracts or companies not paying uh, the minimum wage, although we want companies to go beyond the minimum wage, of course, and pay uh, the living wage. Uh, we've had discussions before, Patrick Harvey and I, about whether there should be more compulsion around the business pledge, and that's something we will continue to consider. Um, but one of the reasons, uh, and I know I'm not able to go into this uh, in great detail here because of the Purder rules, but one of the reasons I will be in London tonight taking part in uh, the debate on the EU referendum is I don't want us to move to a position where we've got a completely deregulated labour market and people like Boris Johnson able to rip up the workers' rights that the EU guarantees in this country. And, uh, I can certainly agree with those final comments and we have given the government credit where it's due for developing the fair work agenda and for promoting it by means of the business pledge. 
But the First Minister says she's willing to consider compulsion. Isn't it abundantly clear, given the scale of the abuses that we know are taking place on a daily basis in our country, that we need to do more than just encourage the willing? We have to make it abundantly clear to the unwilling that these deplorable practices will not be accepted. Will the First Minister ensure that the Fair Work Agenda can in future give real consequences to those employers who exploit their workers, use tax havens, or have poor environmental performance, or the rest of the litany of bad practice, so that they will no longer have access to government-funded taxpayer support, grants, loans, and business support services from the public sector? First Minister. Well, I'm determined and committed to making sure that our fair work agenda, including the business pledge, uh, has the ability to do what we want it to do. But can I say to Patrick Harvey, and I'm broadly in agreement with what he's saying here, some of what we heard uh, from Sports Direct this week uh, was illegal uh, practices, not just unethical practices, but in terms of not paying uh, staff the minimum wage, practices that broke the law. That's not uh, something that we should tackle uh, just through a fair work agenda. That's something that we should make sure is tackled through the law of the land. So when companies break the law in how they treat their staff, they should be held to account, not just in how we uh, distribute government money, they should be held to account through the law of the land. And I hope that all of us in this chamber uh, would agree with that. Question number four, Mary Evans. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the publication of the Cancer Patient Experience Survey. First Minister. Well, I very much welcome the results of the first ever Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey, which shows that 94% of respondents were satisfied with their care. However, we know there's more to be done, which is why earlier this year we announced our cancer strategy supported by £100 million over the life of this Parliament. And that makes clear the importance of listening to what people with cancer are saying about what matters to them and then act on what they tell us. Mary Evans. I thank the First Minister for her response. Does the First Minister agree with me that whilst our Scottish NHS is achieving world-class cancer uh, outcomes, we can't afford to be complacent? And can she outline how the Scottish Government's £100 million cancer strategy will help to ensure that we deliver the best cancer care for the people of Scotland in the future? First Minister. Well, cancer services uh, have come an awful long way in the past decade. Cancer mortality rates, for example, are down 11% over this period. But Mary Evans is right to say that there is more we still need to do. She specifically asked me about the £100 million cancer strategy. Uh, that strategy will be implemented in partnership with people uh, with cancer, their clinicians, service providers, charitable organisations, uh, which do a fantastic job, and of course, other parties in this chamber. And that £100 million will be invested to make sure we're doing more to support prevention of cancer, doing more to support early diagnosis of cancer, and then through taking advantage of advances in radiotherapy, for example, making sure that people have access to the best possible treatment. But in all of that, making sure that the other needs of people with cancer, the emotional needs, the financial needs they often face, the needs of their family, that we're taking account of all of them holistically as well. Uh, that's what I am determined we do uh, so that we can continue to provide world-class cancer services for people who need them. And as our presenting officer, I, I thank Macmillan Scotland and the Scottish Government for the publication of the Cancer Patient Experience Survey but there's also some very deeply concerning stats in the report, including 49% of patients who, despite asking for it, not receiving information on financial support and benefits. 66% of patients not receiving a care plan. 32% of patients saying they didn't get adequate support from health and social care after their treatment. And one in five patients saying that they didn't get an appointment soon enough after the suspicion arose. Given these statistics, and given the ongoing challenge of cancer being the biggest killer in Scotland, can the First Minister confirm that the current expectations on cancer treatment will not be included in her target review? First Minister. Well, obviously, the Health Secretary set out earlier this week the, the purpose of the review um, and how that will be taken forward. And, of course, it's a review uh, backed by clinicians, by the BME and the RCN and many other clinicians. But uh, we've also said that there are certain access targets in the NHS that are vitally important to people to give them the assurance and the certainty of when they'll be treated. And there is absolutely no intention uh, to undermine that whatsoever. And SRWAR is right, uh, of course, to focus not just on the aspects of the cancer survey that were positive, but also the aspects of the cancer survey survey that says we've got more work to do. That was the whole purpose uh, of carrying out this survey in the first place. Uh, many of these areas are 
around not just the clinical aspects of cancer care, uh, but the emotional aspects of cancer care. And these are uh, some of the areas that I think we've got most work still to do on. I remember when I was Health Secretary launching, I think, the first Macmillan uh, financial advice service. Um, these services do fantastic work, but these uh, findings say we've got more to do. So we're focused on all of this uh, prevention, early diagnosis, speedy access to treatment, but also the wider support that patients in this survey tell us they want and need. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of the findings of the latest Bank of Scotland research series report on oil and gas, what support the Scottish Government will offer the industry? First Minister. Well, of course, the oil price has increased since this survey was conducted, uh, but the report undoubtedly highlights the challenges facing the industry and its workforce. Uh, both Keith Brown and Paul Wheelhouse visited Aberdeen last week, where they reiterated our commitment to securing a long-term future for the sector. Uh, we continue to provide practical support to the workforce and industry through, for example, the Transition Training Fund, the Energy Jobs Task Force and our enterprise agencies. Of course, the UK Government retains control of the key taxation levers affecting the sector and a clear conclusion from this report is that more action must be taken on that front, with around half of all companies wanting to see a basin-wide fiscal stimulus for exploration. So we we'll continue to press the UK Government to support exploration and to deliver on its commitment to consider loan guarantees for offshore infrastructure. Lord Fraser. Can I thank the uh, First Minister for a response and remind members there is a briefing in Committee Room 2 immediately after First Minister's questions from Bank of Scotland on this report. One thing this helpful report tells us is that a majority of large companies see the opportunity to diversify into shale gas. But sadly, these opportunities and the jobs that will be created will be located outside Scotland because of the government's stance uh, on its moratorium on fracking. Now, the First Minister says we need to listen to the science on the issue. But she should know what the science says already because her government commissioned this report from its independent expert scientific panel which was published in July 2014, nearly two years ago, and concludes, and I quote, the technology exists to allow the safe extraction of such reserves subject to robust regulation being put in place. So why is the First Minister not listening to her government's own scientists on this matter, and why is she holding back the vital oil and gas industry? Well, I mean, th that's complete nonsense. Uh, the moratorium and fracking has been introduced so that we can study carefully all of the different aspects of this before coming uh, to a decision that is uh, guided uh, by and based on evidence, but also takes into account public opinion, the, the opinion of the public who will, uh, would have to live in areas affected by technology such as this. That is absolutely the right thing to do. But interestingly, uh, Murdo Fraser didn't uh, quote the report w when it comes to diversification fully, because the companies that talked about the opportunities of diversification also talked about the opportunities of diversification into renewables. I wonder why a Tory member of the Scottish Parliament didn't want to mention renewables because against all of the evidence uh, against all of the wishes of people the length and breadth of this country against some of the investment decisions of our company the Tory UK government is currently destroying our renewables potential by the wrong-headed decisions it's taken so perhaps Murdo Fraser would be better advised to go on the phone to his colleagues in the UK government and ask for support for renewables before he comes to this chamber to talk about fracking. Jack Jackie Bailey. On 21st of January, the First Minister was asked when she would provide an updated oil and gas analytical bulletin. She didn't answer then, but I am, of course, persistent, so I'm giving her a second opportunity. Given the severe challenges facing the oil and gas industry outlined starkly in the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce survey in May, will the First Minister now publish a revised oil and gas bulletin, and when will we see it? First Minister. Uh, there will be a revised oil and gas bulletin published in due course and I will make sure Jackie Bailey is one of the first to know uh, when it's, it's due out. But can I say to Jackie Bailey in all, in all seriousness, uh, while it is important that we publish uh, these uh, publications routinely and we will do so, we don't need an oil and gas bulletin revised to tell us about the challenges that are faced in the sector right now. We know that from our own uh, discussions and engagements with the industry. We know that from the report such as the one that we are talking about today. So yes, we'll publish that in due course, but in the meantime, we'll continue to get on with the job of supporting the industry. Practical support on the ground and calling on the UK government to do the right thing as well. Tavish Scott. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that the decommissioning industry is potentially very important to Scotland and indeed the UK in the coming decades. So when she meets Amber Rudd, the Energy Secretary, all but for different reasons tonight, would she undertake to make the point about tax relief being used to make sure that the jobs in that industry are here in Scotland rather than taken overseas to Norway or indeed other European countries? First Minister. Uh, yes, I can uh, give the commitment that we will make uh, that case. I'll do my best to make it tonight, but we'll make it on an ongoing uh, basis. Uh, because there is an important point here. Uh, decommissioning, while we don't want to see premature decommissioning in the North Sea, decommissioning nevertheless is uh, a massive economic opportunity for us. And we want to make sure the benefit of that opportunity is enjoyed here in Scotland and not elsewhere. And part of what we need to do to secure that, of course, is exactly what Tavish Scott says. Make sure the tax incentives and the tax environment in place is the right one and we will continue to argue that case very strongly. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to reverse the reported fall in women studying key subjects in science and computing at higher levels since 2007. First Minister. Well, interestingly, Ian Gray says the reported fall, because uh, it is not an actual uh, fall in most cases. The figures that Ian Gray released to the media over the weekend are simply wrong. Uh, every subject he named, with the exception of computing, has actually seen rises in the number of girls, not falls. Physics, chemistry, biology and human biology, everyone is up. And even including computing, the total number of entries is up 10% in 2007. Now, you might be asking, how come they're so wrong? Well, let me tell you. Ian Gray arrived at his figures by counting only the old hire that was in the process of being replaced. He excluded both the revised and the new hires. Now, I think the question, presiding officer, is whether Ian Gray did this deliberately or whether the Labour education spokesman didn't know that hires were being reformed. Frankly, I'm not sure which is worse. Uh, but in contrast, the Scottish Government will get on with encouraging young people into STEM subjects because they are vital to their future and to Scotland's economic future. Ian Gray. Presiding officer, perhaps the First Minister and I can argue about the numbers another time, but I think we agree. <laughs> I think we agree that we do need more women to choose science. And actually, I wanted to use this opportunity to congratulate her on the appointment of Professor Sheila Rowan as Chief Scientific Advisor. That's a great appointment, but it is also a fantastic role model to encourage more girls and young women into science. And she's a physicist too, which is always good in my view. When Anne Glover was appointed as the first chief scientist in Scotland, she had direct open door access to the then first minister. That's not been the case in recent years. It would be another welcome and powerful signal if the first minister were to re-establish that. Will she consider doing so? First Minister. Uh, I'll consider everything that will help us in this regard. And can I thank Ian Gray for his comments about the appointment yesterday. I agree with him that it is a very positive appointment. But, you know, we can't just gloss over this. It goes back, I, I suppose, to the exchange with myself and Kezia Dugdale. I hope Labour and the SNP can be allies on this educational agenda. But we have to have a debate based on facts, not on distortions. Uh, let me just underline what Labour did at the weekend. They compared 2007 to 2015 in terms of girls going into STEM subjects. They took the 2007 baseline when hires were the only things that young people sat uh, and used that as the baseline. Then they went to 2015 and they only counted the old hires. They didn't include the new hires and the revised hires that are replacing old hires. And they then went to the media on the basis of that information and said that there was a fall in the number of girls studying these science subjects. It was flatly wrong, presiding officer. It was a distortion of the reality and frankly it was a disgrace. So if we are going to move forward to build consensus, to build alliances about improving education for our young people, as I'm determined to do, if Labour want to be part of that, then let's stop the distortion and do it on the basis of facts. Linda Fabiani. First Minister and all girls team from St Andrews and St Bride's School in East Kilbride uh, recently reached the final of the Gopher Set Eco Engineering Challenge, which is run by the Engineering Development Trust. Does the First Minister agree that it would be worthwhile 
to ensure the ongoing success of the Scottish Government's strategies in this field, worthwhile to consider such initiatives as this on a local and national basis, targeted specifically at girls and young women? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. And can I take the opportunity to congratulate the girls from St Andrews and St Bride's High School in Linda Fabiani's constituency uh, for their success? Um, I understand a, a team from Govan High School, which used to be in my constituency, was also uh, successful. I congratulate all of the teams uh, involved. Uh, but can I also agree with Linda Fabiani about the work of the Go For Set scheme? Initiatives like these, I think, do have a huge role to play in inspiring young people and helping them uh, develop their skills and an awareness of the world of work uh, and they often help us tackle outdated stereotypes about so-called boys jobs and so-called girls jobs so uh, we've been pleased to support schemes uh, of a similar nature and uh, we'll continue to do so uh, so let me uh, agree with Linda Fabiani and end again by congratulating all of the teams who took part in the go for set scheme uh, and I should of course remember uh, the team from Kirkcaldy High School who ultimately won the Scottish final. Question number seven, Alex Cole Hamilton. To ask the First Minister on what date the new Queen's Ferry crossing shall open. Minister. Uh, well, as announced uh, by the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy in Parliament yesterday, the Queen's Ferry crossing is expected to be open to traffic by mid May, which, of course, is ahead of the contractual completion date of June 2017. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Many people will find it hard to understand why 25 days lost to adverse weather can lead to a five-month delay in opening the crossing. Indeed, it has been an open secret in my constituency that a delay was inevitable. I learned in January that the facility in Rosyth making concrete road decks did not have capacity to meet target. Does the First Minister really believe Parliament and my constituents to believe that, um, that first, the first that ministers knew of this delay was just after the election and that they knew nothing about the problem with the road decks? First Minister. Well, if the members get any evidence to the contrary, you should really, in all fairness, bring it forward. Because what the Cabinet Secretary said yesterday is absolutely what is the case. Ministers, ministers were informed on the 26th of May that the FCBC were looking at weather impacts. Uh, on June the 1st, the revised programme was ratified by the FCBC board. Uh, since then, uh, ministers have been making sure that Transport Scotland were subjecting uh, that revised programme to rigorous scrutiny. I personally met with the contractors on Tuesday of this week to satisfy myself that everything possible was being done uh, to accelerate progress. And it was at that meeting that uh, we took the decision, rightly, that Parliament should then be informed at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, so that is the uh, facts of the matter, and I would hope that all members across this chamber would accept that. In terms of the other points uh, Alex Cole Hamilton raises, in terms of the, the delay and the implications of the delay, that was set out uh, very clearly by Keith Brown yesterday. Uh, the constructors now believe that deck installation will take two to three months longer than originally expected. That creates a knock-on effect for subsequent activities like road surfacing and wind barriers, which will now take place in the winter months because of that delay. And that is the, the reason for the time scale that has now been set out. But my last point, presiding officer, is this. Uh, the bridge uh, will not be late. Uh, the contractual completion date is June 2017. Uh, so the December target date, which was six months ahead of schedule, will not be met, but it will still open ahead of schedule. This is one of the most wonderful uh, and complex construction projects being undertaken anywhere in the world, and we should all be proud of it, and we should be proud of the people who are building it. Alex Johnson. <laughs> Alex Johnson. Uh, given the wildly optimistic timescales that have now proven to be wildly optimistic and the, pre the, the previous attempts to project short timescales for the repairs of the old bridge, would it not be wise for the First Minister today to generate a little bit more wriggle room? First Minister. I'm not sure I quite understand what the, the question was there. Uh, we are uh, putting uh, forward 
uh, the estimated completion date based on the rigorous assessment and modelling that the contractors we pay to build this bridge uh, have given us. You know, can I say to Alec Johnson, it's not for me as First Minister, I mean, you know, I, I know Kezia Dugdale was praising me earlier on for being so powerful uh, in, in the, the global context, but I'm not a bridge engineer. You know, I, I don't have expertise in building bridges. Uh, other than the ones I build across this chamber all the time. So I, I prefer to take my advice on the timescales and the details of the construction of this fantastic new bridge uh, from the experts that we're paying to build it. That's the sensible thing to do. It's also, incidentally, the thing that ensures we are doing what matters more than anything else, protecting the safety of the brave people that are building the, the fourth bridge. Daniel Johnson. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, the First Minister just mentioned timescales from experts, and I think we can all understand why weather might delay a complicated civil engineering project such as the fourth crossing. However, any complicated project will have contingency built into that project timeline. At what point did the Scottish Government know that that contingency had been used up? And, and would it have been prudent to continue to claim that the December date was, was uh, realistic if they had already known that that contingency was used up? First Minister. Um, let me try to put this simply. If ministers had known what Keith Brown outlined to Parliament yesterday uh, earlier, then no, of course, it wouldn't have been either prudent or appropriate for us still to say that it was going to be open to traffic in December. But that is not the case. Uh, what I've just set out, which Keith Brown set out yesterday, is that ministers became aware that the construct, uh, contractors were looking at the weather impacts uh, on the 26th of May. And I've set out the timeline that happened uh, after that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that but, you know, in a, a project as complex as this, there are challenges to be overcome all the time, and uh, the contractors have overcome those, but have eaten into the contingency time to do that. Until May, they were still confident that notwithstanding uh, the, the worse than predicted weather, they could still meet December, the date that was six months ahead of the contractual uh, completion date. Uh, they then revised that because they realised that wasn't possible. Uh, they've informed ministers in the appropriate way, and ministers have informed Parliament in the appropriate way. That's what has happened. Now, for goodness sake, let it's all got on with backing the people who are building this bridge because we're all looking forward to it being open to traffic next year. Question number eight, Miles Briggs. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service is adequately funded. First Minister. Well, £43 million has currently been invested in a new purpose-built, state-of-the-art national centre that will deliver a first-rate service in the processing, testing, supply, research and development of blood and human donor tissue and cells. And this centre brings together several core activities of the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service into one purpose-built site. NHS National Services Scotland, which is the parent organisation of SNBTS, has been provided with record levels of funding, including a baseline funding increase of £10 million in 2016-17, which is a 2% real terms increase. Miles Briggs. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but Mark Turner, the Medical Director of the Service, has warned that the Scottish Government funding cuts are now so severe that over the course of um, the next Parliament, this is going to say, be facing seriously cuts to the service. Would the First Minister believe that these funding reductions of the scale we're going to see are actually going to help the aim of us increasing the number of blood donors in Scotland? And will she agree to reconsider the funding over the course of this Parliament? First Minister. Well, of course, we're uh, pledging over the life of this Parliament uh, above inflation increases to the health service. I, I should point out the Scottish Government doesn't directly fund SMBTS. We fund the parent organisation, which is NHS National Services Scotland. And I've said the funding for uh, NHS National Services Scotland has increased by £10 million in this financial year, which is a 2% real terms increase. I know uh, the, the vital importance of the work that the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service does. When I was health secretary, I used to see that uh, with my own eyes on a, a regular basis. Uh, it's an important service. It's a highly valued service. Uh, and we'll continue to do uh, everything we can to support it. But 
the last point I would make is around the new centre. The new centre is about bringing all of these services together in one purpose-built site. Now, as well as improving, uh, I'm sure, the quality of the work that it does over the years ahead, it will also enable that service to provide its services in a more joined up and effective and efficient way. That's why that capital investment is so important. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll now move on to members' business. I'll allow a short pause while members clear the chamber. Will those who wish to stay?